All right. Yes, this is an exciting day. I cannot tell you how uh, how excited I've been to have Dr. Felice Gersh on the show for quite some time now. I first heard her on my my beloved Soul Sisters podcast, Karen Martell, The Other Side of Weight Loss. And it just her information just blew my mind. And I, I have so many questions from my patients, from my listeners about estrogen, about the thyroid and estrogen, what role estrogen plays in thyroid function. So we're going to deep dive on that topic today. So let me give a formal introduction first to Dr. Gersh. Felice Gersh, MD, is a multi-award winning physician with dual board certifications in OBGYN and integrative medicine. She's the founder and director of the Integrative Medical Group of Irvine, a practice that provides comprehensive health care for women by combining the best evidence-based therapies from conventional, naturopathic, and holistic medicine. She taught obstetrics and gynecology at Keck USC School of Medicine for 12 years as an assistant clinical professor, where she received the highly coveted Outstanding Volunteer Clinical Faculty Award. She now serves in, as an affiliate faculty member at the Fellowship of in, in Integrative Medicine through the University of Arizona School of Medicine, where she lectures and regularly grades the case presentations written by the fellowship students for their final exams. Felice Gersh, MD, is the best-selling author of PCOS SOS and the PCOS SOS Fertility Fast Track, and she has published articles in peer-reviewed medical journals. She is a prolific lecturer and has been featured in several films and documentary series, including The Real Skinny on Fat with Montel Williams and Fasting with Walter Longo, PhD. He's an amazing man. Her new must-have book, which we just talked about before coming on today, Menopause, 50 Things You Need to Know, is now out and available on Amazon. So we'll definitely put a link for your book. Dr. Gersh, thank you so much for coming on and blessing us with your knowledge today. We need it. We need well, it. I, uh, that's one of my missions is to try to help women wherever they are all over the globe because there's so much misinformation and there's so much that can be done to help women to lead the optimized lives that they deserve. Absolutely. So how did you come to specialize in in hormones and PCOS and estrogen and menopause? How, what was your journey like? Well, as is so common a story, I myself was trying to figure out what was going wrong with my body and my hormones. So way back as a teen, I had the worst acne ever. So I, I, my heart goes out to every woman who deals with that problem. And there was really no treatment and I didn't know what was going on. I thought it was my skin somehow was dirty. And I would take alcohol and I would like scrub my face with rubbing alcohol. So my skin would crack. And of course, it did nothing except make my skin super dry and crack all around the pimples. And then my periods like just disappeared. And I, I was in medical school and I hadn't had a period for two years. So I went to one of the leading people at the university in the department of OBGYN. I said, something is clearly wrong with me. I have all this acne and my period hasn't come for two years. And, and his response was so flippant. It was like, well, women don't even like having periods anyway. You're not trying to get pregnant. So just go on birth control pills, you know, that's, and so it's yeah. like, well, but that's, I mean, even then I knew like, but that's not addressing why, but I was trying to be obedient. So I went on birth control pills, like I was told, and it made me feel really nauseated. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't like it. And, and then it's, so it's like, okay, I I'm going to be an OBGYN. Plus I loved the field because it was so adrenaline uh, pushing, you know, I loved like going there for the deliveries. And, and of course, you know, sometimes there's life and death situations where right. you have to deal with like acute issues like cord prolapse, hemorrhaging, abruption, you know, all kinds of things. And it, it was an interesting blend of medical issues because every medical problem can exist in a pregnant woman. You need to know how to deal with it and the medical complications of pregnancy. And also I loved the idea of using my hands to be a skilled technician and do surgeries and so on. And I did all of that for many, many years. But then my time came and I wanted to um, like 
really like move on. So I gave up obstetrics so I could actually get some sleep because it was like many years of sleep deprivation. And then I started looking at other avenues, like how can I really help women? I started calling all the drug reps to come in my office and then show me their original studies that we used to get their drug FDA approved. And I was shocked at how minimal the difference was between mm -hmm. their effect and placebo effect. Mm -hmm. And also the, the side effect profile. And it's like, why am I prescribing this drug? It's like, doesn't really do much. And so that's when I went on my personal journey to find other ways to help women. And I did the fellowship at the University of Arizona School of Medicine for two years in integrative medicine. And then I've just gone on perpetual journey of, you know, I became a course junkie and then a PubMed junkie. So I would read all the published articles across all different fields of medicine. And I became what I call a synthesizer. I would look at all the different data and put it together, which, you know, looking at all the organ systems, all the specialties to come up with a cohesive understanding of the female body. And of course, along the way, I had to diagnose myself with yep. Picos, you know, because nobody else did. And um, and so that became also one of my passions. And of course, now that I'm a menopausal woman, of course, menopause, you know, we're always a little bit into self-interest. But fortunately, my journey has mirrored every other female's journey. So my learning, um, you know, journey has been very beneficial for all of my patients, as well as myself, because we all, not every woman has polycystic ovary syndrome, but it's the poster child for all the blending of metabolic and reproductive problems mm -hmm. that you can have, even if you don't have that particular syndrome. And there's not a woman on this planet who will live long enough and will avoid menopause. So that's our universal, like unifying experience for every single female across every single continent. And it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, you're going to hit menopause. So we all need to understand it so we can deal with it appropriately. We do and not be scared of it, I think. And I love how you say that's our unifying kind of connection of all women, because you're right. It's, it's, it's coming. You can't take a pill to avoid menopause. You can take things to help it, but you can't take a pill to avoid it. Correct. And when you mentioned PCOS, I see that so very often in my patients or my following with hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's. Do you see oh. that correlation a lot? Oh my practice? goodness. Yes. And I'm so glad that you picked up on that because not everybody does. And it's really unfortunate that, that so many doctors ignore that issue and they don't even test for thyroid antibodies it's like not considered standard of care but of course it should so women with polycystic ovary syndrome pcos or picos they have we now know from studies that originally came out of china and then have been replicated in other other places they have a dysbiotic or abnormal gut microbiome mm -hmm. and so you have this ultimately a leaky gut or impaired gut barrier, because when you don't have the right microbes, it doesn't interact with our own lining cells and immune cells to create this protective mucus coating to keep the toxins from in the gut from damaging the tissues, the little fibrous tissues that connect the different cells that line the gut lining. And so they start drifting apart due to like this degradation of these materials that hold the cells together in these what are called tight junctions. So these toxic products that are called LPS or lipopolysaccharides, also known as endotoxins, toxins from within, they can actually pass between these little sections between the gut lining cells and then enter the body itself where our immune system lies in great measure, like 70, 80% of our immune system resides surrounding the gut and these immune cells are designed to activate when they're exposed to damaged tissue and pathogens. So you have this perpetual damaged tissue and also particles and also the actual microbes coming into our body. And this just goes on and on. It's like a chronic state of infection. And now we know that our, like you can say like the building blocks of nature, whether it's a virus or a bacteria or a human being are the same. We have like the same nucleotides. We're like from the same amorphous primordial pool, right? And mm -hmm. so if you think of a bacteria or a virus, like a Lego, we're like Lego land on steroids, you know, but when you look at it, we are still made of the same things. And that's why when you have 
any infection and you make antibodies, because that's what our immune cells are trained to do, it always cross reacts with our own tissues because it's like, um, you know, like friendly fire. It doesn't distinguish between us and the enemy, but it's okay because that's supposed to be short lived. An infection should happen. We get over it. We get back to living a healthy life. And those anti the antibodies no longer are going to be produced. But when you have a leaky gut and you have this perpetual leaking in of viruses and bacteria that ultimately are similar enough with antigens like protein similarities, the antibodies are perpetually being made. And over time, they cross react and can, that's what autoimmunity is. So they're damaging and attacking our own tissues. And the most common is the thyroid gland. So thyroid is the most common of the autoimmune conditions. Mm -hmm. And now we know that women with PCOS have a significantly higher rate of this type of autoimmune condition, but it could also incur other types of autoimmune diseases as well. Just the thyroid is the most common and it is so under tested and under recognized and thyroid, oh my gosh, is, you know, every hormone in the body has critically important it functions. And if you have an inadequate supply of thyroid hormones, oh my goodness, there's not a single cell in the body that's going to be functioning optimally. Exactly. Oh, I'm so happy you said that. I have so many questions for you. I don't even know where to start. So we're just going to let this roll. So kind of coming off of the PCOS, I know that they changed the diagnostic criteria for PCOS recently, where you don't actually have to have cysts on your ovaries. Because I know there's going to be people listening and going, well, I, I, I got an ultra. I don't have cysts on my ovaries and you don't even have to have that anymore. Right. Well, you know, when they come up with a diagnostic criteria, you get a bunch of people in a room and they hash it out and there are going to be dissenters. There's going to be the agreeers and so on. And so it's basically an opinion piece. So okay. it's not dictated by nature. So I and the androgen excess, you know, PCOS society, they believe, for example, that you should have androgen excess, like you should have excessive amounts of DHEAS, that's the adrenal androgen, or mm -hmm. testosterone should be in excess. And I agree with that, but it didn't come out of that particular. So they have different labels, different criteria, but it's really important because it goes to the mechanistic causation issues, you know, when you look at this. And there are different types of PCOS. So if you think about the ovaries, so the majority, about 80% of PCOS is ovarian based. So by that, it is that there's this problem that's in the ovaries that is not right. And it involves the enzyme aromatase that converts testosterone into estradiol, the estrogen made by the ovaries. And it's important to know that all estrogen derives from androgens. All estradiol in the ovary comes from testosterone. So it's like an assembly line. It goes down and you have testosterone, it's converted into estradiol. But if you don't have the proper functioning of that enzyme, you get like a buildup of testosterone because it's not converted in a proper amount and order into the estradiol. So you have too little estradiol, too much testosterone, and that leads to a whole host of problems. And why is it that you don't have this proper functioning? Well, we don't 100% know, but it's probably the perfect storm of endocrine disruptors, exposure during in uterine life, um, mm -hmm. combined with genetic propensities, combined with poor diet and yep. stress and circadian rhythm dysfunction. So yep. it's complex, but you end up with this basic problem in the ovary. And so it turns out that you're very good at recruiting follicles, but you don't, you don't have, you need in order to get the, I call it the special one, the one that gets selected for ovulation. You need this giant spike of estrogen, this giant spike of estrogen production that precedes ovulation. And if you don't get that, which you don't get when you can't convert enough and rapidly testosterone into estrogen, then you end up perpetually recruiting follicles, but never selecting one for ovulation. And these little follicles that never go anywhere start accumulating around the rim of the ovaries, creating that look that they call like a ring of pearls that mm -hmm. gave the name PCOS to the condition. So that is pretty much always going to be the case in women who have that 
most common type of PCOS. But then there's the outlier type of PCOS that's adrenal based that has gotten even less attention and less research. Mm -hmm. And that particular form of PCOS is where the adrenal gland makes an excessive amount of its androgen, D-H-E-A-S, and that creates a lot of excessive um, facial hair and mm -hmm. recalcitrant cystic acne. And when you have the high levels of androgens like DHES, that converts to testosterone. So you also have higher levels of testosterone. In the female body, half the testosterone comes in a normal female from the adrenal and half from the ovaries. So you still have high testosterone, you have high DHES, and you have a lot of problems from androgen excess. And when once you have the higher amounts of these androgens, it in turn affects the gut microbiome in its own way, and it causes more inflammation, it dysregulates the ovary. So ultimately, the ovary gets dragged into the scene as an accessory, but not the primary issue. And, and then you get malfunction in terms of anovulation. But they're actually kind of different and although they can manifest very similarly. And that's where the confusion comes. And because there has been so little interest, even though PCOS is the most common endocrine disorder of women, the most common cause of infertility, the mm -hmm. amount of research dollars like it through the NIH is downward trending every year. And what research there is, is wholly on infertility, which is important, yep. but this is a comprehensive metabolic condition that affects every organ system in the female. And there just hasn't been the attention and the research that needs to go into helping to create better solutions. And, and that's why I had to go on my own to try to figure this out and to try to come up with solutions that combine, like, because I'm integrative, when necessary, certain select pharmaceuticals, yep. hopefully not for life. You know, I call them a bridge to health to help get things right. Like sort of like to dampen the fires that women have with PCOS because they're very inflamed and inflammation Definitely. underlies so many problems. Mm -hmm. And then um, to always, always use enormous amounts of lifestyle medicine and targeted supplements to help these different organ systems get back on track. And insulin resistance is huge too with PICO. So with that insulin, right. I mean, they're just a, a ball, like you said, a ball of inflammation with high insulin. So when you bring that down, oftentimes things come into proper alignment while treating all the other lifestyle factors and the gut, like you mentioned earlier. Now, I, I've heard you talk before about estrogen dominance and and kind of your take on it. Now, I'll tell you what, what I see, and then I want you to kind of piggyback with your experience and your knowledge. I see a lot of estrogen dominance, not so much in the PICOS population. Normally with them, I will see the higher androgens, testosterone, mm -hmm. bottomed out progesterone, and estrogen can kind of be anywhere. It could be normal. It could be low. But then as even when, when we start moving into 30s, 40s, 50s, which PICOS can still be present, of course, but kind of that perimenopausal state that's where I'll see a lot of estrogen dominance. I'll have women in that are 32 with a progesterone level of a postmenopausal woman and an estrogen, you know, 400. And to me, that's an estrogen dominant state that could interfere with thyroid function. So I want to get your take on that. So the only typical time, there are a few rare exceptions, when a woman's ovaries are actually excessively producing estradiol is during the menopausal transition years, the you know perimenopausal time, which of course can be any time in a woman's life, unfortunately, because we know that there's a, a condition premature ovarian insufficiency. But typically the average age for menopause in the United States is around, which is defined as 12 consecutive months without a period, which is mm -hmm. totally arbitrary. Um, and, but that would be based on that official label around 51 in that range. Now you can be in the transition into menopause, which is really ovarian aging. Well, that's kind of your whole life, but in terms of actually having symptoms and changes that are really significant in the ovaries that affect, you know, really quality of life can happen for the decade before, but typically it's about five years, but it's very individualized. Now, what happens is the downward trend is always there in terms of estrogen production. So the 
estrogen production from the ovary is going to go down, down, down. But along that path down, you get spikes up. So it's like the worst case scenario for a stock market. You know, it's down and then spike up and then down and spike up. And the reason that that happens is that you still have ovaries that have eggs and they still can respond to the hormonal signals that are coming from the pituitary gland, which of course are in response to the signals that come from the brain, from the hypothalamus of the brain. So it's like when we try to get women to ovulate and or collect eggs, say, if someone's gonna have um, egg collection for egg freezing or for IVF purposes, they want to hyper ovulate them. They want to get a whole bunch of eggs out. You don't wanna do like one at a time from yeah. you know a year. So they hyper ovulate. And they do that by using a synthetic version of follicle stimulating hormone to just, um, you know, and with LH and you get, whoa, all these eggs coming out in a woman so you can collect them. Well, nature does that in the perimenopausal time. So you'll get this giant amount of FSH, which causes like a load of eggs to come out. That's why during the perimenopausal years is the most common time for twins because you're actually off super ovulating because you get what happens is the estrogen is going down the brain has sensors and says oh not enough estrogen so it puts out the signal to the pituitary and the pituitary will over you know produce fsh so you get this like hyper stimulation to the to the ovaries and you get this gigantic spike of estrogen which then remember the spike of estrogen is what triggers the ovulation. So you get this gigantic spike that's sometimes double what the normal spike, that's the highest amount of estrogen for the cycle. Maybe you'll get, you know, normally would be 300 something. You could, I've seen people 800, you know, so you'll get this gigantic spike and then you get multiple eggs coming out. And um, the poor woman is on this roller coaster because then of course the, it dies down and then she may go three months of having low estrogen and then another, whoa, and then her estrogen comes skyrocketing and then she puts out a whole you know slew of eggs again and and it's really um a challenging time because the hyper estrogen state at that time when when she super is producing estrogen can cause exacerbation of breast tenderness and then PMS symptoms and uh, migraines in people prone. Some people who've never had migraines suddenly will develop migraines and mood disorders and sleep problems because this roller coaster. So, you know, it's really a challenge now. The conventional world just puts all those women on birth control pills. Yeah. And yeah. that has a whole slew of problems because, you know, that's like a whole, you know, webinar on its own because of all the pro inflammatory problems. Um, associated with birth control pills and thyroid effects as well. And um, so there are other ways that we can deal with it. In terms of the thyroid gland, estrogen is very important for creating binding proteins. And these binding proteins will increase in the amount that they're existing in the body when you have higher levels of estrogen. That's why when women are pregnant, if they are on thyroid therapy, mm -hmm. um, they need to be monitored because their thyroid will actually be less in terms of the free amount because more of it is going to be bound up right. by these binding proteins. Mm -hmm. And so you can actually end up underdosing women who are pregnant. It's so important to have just right amounts of thyroid in pregnancy to make sure that the baby's brain develops properly yep. and yep. also their own thyroid receptors are developing properly. So of course this can happen to women when their estrogen level is too high, but it's up and down, you know, so it's, it's really um, a challenge, but you can then have where you have symptoms of high thyroid um, binding, you know, so that you have functionally low thyroid, but mm -hmm. if you measure the total thyroid, you're not measuring free or unbound and you're measuring totals, they'll say, well, your thyroid is just fine. And if you look at the TSH, the TSH may be fine, but yes. functionally that woman is hypothyroid because so much of her thyroid is being bound by this excessive production of binding proteins for thyroid. Um, and so, and this is often missed. And so many women are misdiagnosed and, and also made 
to feel belittled and not listened to. Because on the other, on the flip side, when estrogen levels are low, and during this time, it's totally like a roller coaster, high, low, high, low. And when estrogen is low, estrogen upregulates thyroid receptors so that the thyroid hormone that you have will actually bind work better to the thyroid receptors and then create the effects that thyroid is supposed to have because it doesn't matter no matter how much hormone you have if it doesn't get in the receptor and activate the receptor you're going to have nothing happen that's what happens when people have insulin resistance that's why i use that as an example because most people know that if you're pre-diabetic or diabetic you have insulin resistance what does that mean it means that the hormone insulin is not properly binding to the receptor to create the needed effect which is the ability to transport glucose across cell membranes so the glucose can get into the cell that needs it to create energy and so forth. Instead, it's just circulating in the blood, creating havoc. Mm -hmm. So this can happen with thyroid as well. If you have thyroid hormone receptor resistance, because you don't have enough estrogen, you can measure in the blood the thyroid hormone, and it can be totally fine. It looks great, but it isn't working properly on the receptor. And that's what happens when estrogen levels drop, both in the perimenopausal time when it's up and down, and also, of course, in the postmenopausal years, if a woman isn't on physiologic hormone therapy, like hormone replacement, then her thyroid hormones are not going to bind properly to the receptor to create the effect. So, so many women after menopause have symptoms that they read the book and they have every symptom on the list. And yet they go in, the doctor says, no, your thyroid hormone levels are fine. And then right. he thinks or thinks, oh, another crazy woman, you know, who's yep. like reading too much online, you know, Dr. Google is, you know, giving her information and she's like looking at the symptoms, but that's not what she has. When in fact, she does have it, you know, and it's like my hair is falling out. I can't sleep. I have no energy. I, you know, I'm cold. Yep. I'm constipation. It's like, uh, oh, sounds like low thyroid. Oh, no, your thyroid hormone levels are fine. No, it doesn't matter how much you have if it doesn't work in the receptor. So, too low of estrogen is as bad for thyroid hormone binding to the receptor site as high estrogen, because let's say someone is on thyroid replacement therapy. So they're on, I mean, most of the time we see them on T4 only, which is a shame, but let's say they're even on T4 only or NDT. And we need that T4 to convert over to, to T3 to bind to the receptor. High estrogen will interfere. We know in an estrogen dominant state that will interfere with T4 or right. T3 conversion. So, so will low estrogen, or you're just saying low estrogen will, will, prevent the binding to the cell. Am I right. getting that right? So, you know, that's why um, when you go on hormones, you really have to know what's going on. And that's why you can't just, it's not one size fits all because we know that how, like, let's be real. Menopause is natural. It's just naturally not very good for <laughs> women. Fine. You know, it's, maybe it's good for the species, but for the individual, no, it's not good. It promotes aging and all kinds of problems. So, but you can't just, it's not one size fits all. And you can't look at someone and say, oh, I know exactly what hormone dose you need. Of course you don't, because nature never intended us to take hormones after menopause. Of course, that's not natural. And of course, I don't care because I'm a little bit selfish and yep. I, I want to live and be optimally healthy, not live a life of declining health over the next, you know, 35, 40 years. That's not what I'm looking for. Yep. So I don't care if I use tools. I mean, all, everything in medicine is about using tools to enhance what nature like messed up in our, you know, like, like we replace cataracts, we replace joints, we take pharmaceuticals, mm -hmm. you know, we do all kinds of things with makeup and plastic surgery. None of that is natural. And that's why when you give hormones after menopause, I know it's not natural, but it's better for our bodies to have hormones than not. If someone came and took out your thyroid gland, I wouldn't say, well, now you can eat more vegetables. I mean, of course <laughs> I want people to eat vegetables, but there's no replacement for a missing hormone other than giving the hormone. Now there are um, you know, things that can ameliorate the damage and the symptoms. So of course you can give phytoestrogens and I'm all for eating flax seeds, you know, but that's not the same and it doesn't bind 
equally and in balanced way the different hormone receptors. It doesn't go to the different organs the same way. So even though there are benefits to doing everything lifestyle, of course, it's part of the solution, but you can't have the ultimate solution if you're lacking a vital hormone, you just can't, you know, you lose your thyroid gland, you have to get thyroid hormone in. you lose your ovarian function, even though it's natural, it's still not good not to have the hormones produced by the ovaries. That's why people who are 70 are not as healthy as people who are 25. That's a big part of it. If we keep the body getting everything it needs, nutrition, fitness, stress control, and hormones, you know, everything, each cell in your body doesn't know how old it is. Most of those cells were not there when you were born. So they will do what they're genetically programmed to do if they have everything they need. Now we can't replace 25 year old ovaries yet. I don't, we don't. So when I give hormones to women who are in their 50s, 60s and, and older, I know that I'm not giving them the same hormone blend and and rhythms and everything else that they had when they were 25. It's not best because we don't have best. Best is you turn the clock back and you're 25, but it's better. So we have to be accepting better. Just like if you have Hashimoto's and we give thyroid, it's not the same, the same pulsing, the same rhythm, the same dosing, everything that your natural thyroid gland was making if it was working in pristine condition. It's Mm -hmm. just better than not doing something. So, and so we take better and we turn it into a better quality of life, even though we know it's not the same as that organ doing its best in the most you know, optimal way. It's still so much better. And that's where, you know, the really the practice of medicine comes in is how to take something that isn't in the best shape, whether it's due to aging or due to autoimmune disease or, you know, cancer of the thyroid, whatever it is, and then turning it to be better. And then the best of better that we can make it. I love that because I'm, all, I'm always saying that about the thyroid gland. It, it boggles my mind how even Doctors can remove the thyroid gland and then just replace it with T4, but it used to produce T4 and T3, but we're just going to give it one out of two hormones. So that would be like, oh, a woman going into menopause and we're going to give you just testosterone. Like, wait a minute. What about the other hormones? So I'm I'm very happy you you use that analogy and that you said that. And and kind of springboarding off of what you said, we replace hormones that are no longer being properly made. So now you have the attention of women out there that maybe they went through breast cancer, or maybe their mom or sister, aunt went through breast cancer, and they have been told by conventional medicine, you need to avoid hormones at all costs because breast cancer is in your family or you went through it already yourself. So what is the deal with that? The true deal? So- there's a couple of differences here. If you have a family history of breast cancer, I do recommend that you get genetic testing. Mm -hmm. um, And that way, you know, your statistical risk, which is really sad because we know that these genes are not destiny, they're risks. And we know that years and years ago, that people who had those same genes, uh, like they'll say variations or mutations, they were not associated with the same high incidence of breast cancer that they are today because of our you know food that's not the same and our environmental endocrine disruptors that are affecting how genes are expressed even in utero exposures and and life's our life in utero can change ultimately how our genes are expressed mm-hmm. so but given the world that we do live in i think every woman who has a family history should have her genetic testing so she knows statistically what her risk may be but let's assume that there is no genetic thing there and it's just you know, like you have the same you know risk except from a genetic point of view that we have been able to determine but you have some family history well it's so misunderstood 
how breast cancer occurs in the relationship to estrogen. First of all, the vast majority still of breast cancers occur in postmenopausal women who don't have ovarian function and are not making estrogen. Mm -hmm. And women who are younger, premenopausal women, the incidence of breast cancer, unfortunately, is really increasing very significantly, like seven times what it used to be decades ago. And that's not because they have estrogen. It's because their bodies are filled with endocrine disruptors. For example, they, there's data that when they were exposed to certain pesticides, like when they used to spray the beaches and so on with DDT, you know, that yep. they would get exposed to different pesticides and chemicals when they were maybe a young teen, that that changes the genetic expression and predisposes them to breast cancer, for example, in their 40s. So mm -hmm. there's a long latent period there between the toxic exposure and then the ultimate cancer that develops. So that's something to really um, appreciate that it's not because they have hormones, it's because their bodies have been unfortunately exposed to chemical endocrine disruptors, which have a, a altered gene expression and promoted different gene expressions associated with cancer development. And so in terms of that group, people who know that they were exposed to say chemical exposures, what should they avoid? Like the plague, like hormonal contraception, because that's putting another risk factor of an endocrine disruptor in their body. What they want, if they can, I mean, you can't like create all of these things, but in an optimal world, you would have babies when you're like 19 and 20, you would breastfeed for three years, you know, you would avoid hormonal contraception, you would mm -hmm. eat all organic foods, and, and, and you would avoid every kind of chemical exposure that you can possibly avoid, you know, air purifiers, water purifiers, and so on to lower your toxic load and to try to um, change how your genes are expressed. We know that early pregnancies and breastfeeding can actually also change gene, gene expression within the breast to lower the risk of breast cancer. So, but you know, I can't tell everyone who's a teenager, you should plan on having your baby soon. I mean, so we, we live right. in the world we live in. So we just have to at least try to recognize that some things like um, hormonal contraceptives have been shown to have an increased association with breast cancer. And yet that is so poo-pooed. It's like nobody pays any attention to that. And there are some alternative birth control methods that can at least be utilized for more of a woman's reproductive life than they are to try to avoid, at least limit the number of years of exposure to what are technically, officially endocrine disruptors that can create harm in the female body in a whole myriad of ways. In terms of like postmenopausal women, what happens in a postmenopausal woman that increases her risk of breast cancer is inflammation. So inflammation, chronic unrelenting inflammation becomes the state of a female body after menopause when she doesn't have estrogen because estrogen from the ovaries is what we call an immunomodulator. It's like amazing what it does with the immune system. It actually initiates the inflammatory response so that if you're a trauma, of a trauma victim, you know, you've gotten burn or a laceration or infected with a pathogen, it activates the inflammatory pathways so that you can deal with it effectively because inflammation is how we fight trauma, injury, and pathogens. But then as an immunomodulator, estrogen like pulls the switch and converts from a pro to an anti-inflammatory status when appropriate. But after menopause, it gets sort of stuck in the pro-inflammatory state. That's sort of okay. like the default state is like chaos and inflammation. Mm -hmm. So you end up with this chronic state of inflammation. The gut microbiome becomes dysbiotic, abnormal. You get leaky gut. You know, you end up more with fatty liver. You have, um, then you have all the degradations of the different organ systems that are all pro-inflammatory, like osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, um, neuroinflammation, you know, memory, cognitive mood problems, the whole cardiovascular system. All of these are inflammatory processes. And the breast is no exception. The breast becomes pro-inflammatory. When you have a situation where you have a chronic state of inflammation, it can lead to DNA breakage. Now, estrogen can be made in specific organs. It's called paracrine production. It's made in an organ for specific use in that organ. Now, that's how men get estrogen. They have a ton of estrogen. It's just not circulating. It's made in organs like the gut and the brain, 
um, and in the arteries and so on for use within those organs. Now, the breasts make estrogen. Now, why would the breast make estrogen? Because I just told you it's an immunomodulator. What if a woman gets a breast infection while she's breastfeeding? Estrogen to the rescue. <clears throat> estrogen <clears throat> will create ah. a proper inflammatory response to fight off that breast infection, that mastitis, and then calm it down so that you don't have unrelenting, out of control inflammation in the breast. <clears throat> so inflammation is the trigger to upregulation of the enzyme called aromatase, the same mm -hmm. enzyme that exists in the ovaries, but it exists mm -hmm. in these other tissues, and inflammation upregulates aromatase. So you get an increased conversion of androgens into mm -hmm. estrogens, mm -hmm. and that occurs in the breast. Now, the androgen that's being predominantly converted is DHEA and DHEAS, and mm -hmm. that converts predominantly into estrone. Now, estrone is not the same estrogen that the ovaries make. It is the estrogen that binds predominantly to just one receptor, which is the alpha receptor. All breast cancer that's estrogen receptor positive is receptor positive for the alpha receptor. Okay. Now, what happens is you now have chronic inflammation and you have this upregulation of production in estrogen. That's why when women are older, like postmenopausal, and they have a mammogram that shows dense breasts, that's because they're inflamed in their breasts and they're making too much estrogen in their breasts, but they cannot control this in inflammation. It's not like a breast infection, like from breastfeeding. This is right. chronic, unrelenting. There's no end in sight. And the estrogen cannot dampen this. It cannot control it. Plus, it's the wrong form of estrogen because you don't have the same testosterone production as when you age. And it's more, you end up with more DHEAS relatively. And then you have more estrone as opposed to estradiol. Now, there is a you know, there is some equilibrium that goes on, but it's predominantly estrone that's being produced. So you now have this situation where estrogen, which is one of its main features, is it pro-growth and proliferative. Now that's how you heal. If you don't have enough estrogen and you have a, a big cut on your skin, you won't heal. That's why right. old people don't heal as fast because they don't have this amount of estrogen in their skin. So, yes. so we don't have the ability to um, control a lot of things as we age. So we end up <clears throat> with this chronic state of inflammation in the breast, overproduction of estrogen. Chronic inflammation leads to DNA breakage and estrogen is pro-growth. Now, it's when, it's you, when everything is right, it's balanced. But here, it's, what happens is if you get breakage of the DNA, you get breast cancer, you have estrogen, which is like um, sort of hijacked and it actually starts, the genes are expressed differently. You actually change gene expression with the cancer and it takes estrogen and turns it into a growth promoting machine. Okay. So it can promote the growth of the breast cancer, which is alpha and the estrone is binds to alpha. So you have this problem. Now, so what, what is one of the solutions? Well, one of the solutions is to prevent the inflammation in the first place. So if you take a woman and she hits perimenopause and she's going into menopause. If she goes on physiologic dosing of estradiol, the balanced estrogen, and mm -hmm. she eats the right diet and she maintains proper thyroid and she maintains, you know, stress and sleep and all those things that are modulated through proper lifestyle choices. And she prevents this chronic state of inflammation that was coined as inflammaging, this chronic inflammation yep. with aging, that affects the breast. And we don't get that inflammation in the breast then guess what? None of this will even happen because if you don't have inflammation, you won't have upregulation of production of estrogen in the breast and you won't have the DNA breakage from the chronic inflammation in the breast. So being proactive and going on physiologic sort of like a rhythm, so some mm -hmm. sort of a rhythm where you, and progesterone, we know it, when you have progesterone that comes for two weeks, it actually upregulates tumor suppressor genes. Nature didn't plan for breast cancer, it planned against it. So progesterone, when it's pulsed, it actually can promote tumor suppressor genes. And the estrogen of a rhythmic menstrual cycle does too. That's why I'm now involved in some research to look at trying to replicate a true menstrual cycle type of hormonal delivery system, but we don't have that yet. We don't have the data, but we know from medical science that 
when you have a real menstrual cycle, it actually helps prevent breast cancer. But we can still do better. Like I said, maybe we can't do best yet, but we right. can do better by giving physiologic levels of estrogen, which helps prevent inflammation because estrogen prevents this in the first place when you have the right form of estrogen, of estradiol, mm -hmm. and it's not in tiny amounts, it's in physiologic levels. So you're actually getting the right amount just like thyroid, you don't want a whiff of thyroid, you want the right amount. You want right. the right amount of estradiol, and then you want the right amount of progesterone, whether or not you have a uterus. I mean, that's like crazy. You need progesterone as sort of like the sidekick of estradiol. And when you give this in this balanced way, you'll prevent inflammation from occurring all through the body, including in the breast tissue. Now, once you have breast cancer, it's it's a more of a challenge because you have hijacked genes, you have changed their expression. But if you have actually cured the person of breast cancer, as best you can tell, like they have lymph node negative, they had you know no reason to think there's still breast cancer in the body. Then if truthfully, if you give hormones in a physiologic balanced way, you will probably prevent recurrence of breast cancer. But we don't have the data. We have the hypotheticals from science and knowing how this works and how it works. But the problem is that we have such um, like this pervasive fear of hormones and lack mm -hmm. of understanding of estrogen. And they think of estrogen as birth control pills, which is right. a endocrine disruptor. It's like strawberry flavored jelly beans are equal to organic strawberries. Like that sounds so crazy, but that's what happens with estrogen. Yep. And, you know, they have the evil mimics, <laughs> the evil twins that are like people think that that's the real the real good guy is, is but they think it's the evil twin. So we need to change the paradigm of thinking of estrogen and recognize that the body didn't create estrogen and progesterone to give us breast cancer. <laughs> no, right. it actually prevents breast cancer. And it's this chronic state of inflammation that promotes DNA breakage and this upregulation of aromatase and the production of the wrong form of estrogen that can actually support breast cancer because every system becomes hijacked and gene expression is changed and so forth. And when you have high amounts of estrogen, it actually promotes certain genes that keep tissue integrity. So for example, you know, when you have low levels of estrogen, you're more likely to have cancers break apart and then become metastatic, whereas estrogen helps to maintain tissue integrity through certain gene expressions. So it's really so critical for women to understand that it's endocrine disruptors that are underlying the early onset of premenopausal breast cancer, and it's loss of our estrogen and yeah. chronic inflammation that predisposes to postmenopausal breast cancer. And that although if you read the, you know, the fine print, it says you should never give hormones to a woman who had breast cancer. Um, if a woman is fully informed, she seems to be cured of breast cancer. And she really is looking at the rest of her life, living a state of, ins of estrogen deficiency and doesn't want that, then it's her right to make a decision as long as it's mm -hmm. fully informed and consented to decide if she wants to go on hormones. But if someone has active uh, metastatic breast cancer, um, right. it is possible, right, that you may actually fuel the growth of that breast cancer that's estrogen receptor positive. So that that becomes more problematic, of course, in our world to give, give estrogen. But of course, if a woman makes that decision fully informed, of course, that should also be her choice. Everyone should have the choice with full information to control their own bodies. Absolutely. Informed consent, right? So wink, wink. Um, with that, I, I believe the medical community it, it always focuses on the synthetic form. So like the Women's Health Initiative study was using synthetic forms of, of hormones and birth control is synthetic. It's a complete, like you said, it, it's totally different. You cannot even put bioidentical real estrogen that you would use no. to treat someone in the same category as birth control. It's completely different and has totally, totally. different effects on the body. It absolutely does. Like real estrogen from the ovaries actually is anti-blood clotting. It's anti-inflammatory. So birth control pills increase blood clots. We know that. Everyone knows that. Well, why the heck is that? 
because the birth control pill goes into the body predominantly as estrone. And estrone, which, as I mentioned, only activates the alpha receptor. The alpha receptor is located on the innate immune cells, like the macrophages, the neutrophils, the mast cells. That's part of the essential inflammatory response. So when you only have the alpha, it's like you only have the on switch to promoting inflammation. And part of the inflammatory response is platelet aggregation or you know, clumping of platelets and then activating them to initiate blood clots so that you don't die if you're traumatized. And also blood clotting, the platelets that become activated can help to wall off an abscess. If you wonder how does the body do such a crazy, amazing thing, like if you have an abscess, even intra-abdominal, in your abdominal cavity, that the body can create a capsule, like a fibrous container that holds this infection in place, and that's an abscess. How does the body do it? It's through activating the platelets because the platelets not only create blood clotting, they also create um, tissue. That's why people love, you know, platelets in their skin, you know, to yeah, create yeah. collagen, you know, because you're creating damage, the platelets are activated, and then you create growth of tissue. Well, you can do that to wall off an abscess, you can do that to create blood clotting, so you don't hemorrhage if you get a big laceration. But this kind of activation of the pro-inflammatory pathway is going on continuously when you have only estrone, which is what birth control pills put in the female body. And mm -hmm. it, and even, and then by the way, when you take the conjugated equine estrogens, the brand name that was used in the Women's Health Initiative was Premarin. Mm -hmm. And that means conjugated equine estrogens. It came from a pregnant horse and it had already gone through the horse's liver for the purpose of getting it out of the body through the urine. So the horse didn't even want didn't it. Didn't even in. want it. <laughs> no, I was like, get this is my old, and it had a whole bunch of other crap mixed in with it. It wasn't even like pure anything. It was like, you know, like 20 different compounds in all different amounts. It was like, that's why they could never, uh, no one could ever like m completely mimic it because it was completely <laughs> like, Nobody even could decipher what was actually in that stuff. So, you know, you, you couldn't, it never went off patent because nobody could like actually recreate it. And it was like bizarre, all kinds of blends of stuff from the pregnant horse trying to get rid of it. And when you take though, when you swallow the conjugated equine estrogens, it predom it has all these weird stuff. But the, the main one that affects the humans that we know is estrone. It also turns into estrone. So that's why it, it, it created, it created that increase of blood clots. And when you have increased blood clotting in an older person, that increases things like strokes and heart attacks, and of course, pulmonary emboli. So of course we would never give that. Now, none of that happens when you have transdermal bioidentical estrogen, the good twin, because estrogen from the ovary, estrogen taken through the skin in the same form of estradiol is not pro-inflammatory. When you have adequate amounts of estrogen, it keeps what we call homeostasis. It keeps things in that calm state and you only activate the inflammatory pathway when you need it activated, not for no reason at all, That which happens when you have too much estrone and you have you know, elderly people that you know have all kinds of other nutrient deficiencies and the whole host of things that tend to go down along with it, down this rabbit hole of aging. So the last thing that people should think is that when you have human type bioidentical estrogen, that it promotes inflammation, that it promotes blood clotting, that it causes high blood pressure, that it causes cancer, that it, it does the exact opposite it's so crazy when you have balanced estrogen in the form of estradiol at physiologic levels, it keeps everything in this happy, calm state. And But it's ready to roll if you are like traumatized, if you have a pathogen like COVID trying to get into you, then it completely changes its, uh, you know, its shape. So it's like a shape shifter. And then it totally is different and it activates the macrophages. It activates tissue clotting. It activates you know, like the growth factors, the tissue remodeling, it, it does a million and one things to allow the body to successfully survive a trauma or an infectious pathogen trying to get in. And then it creates that beautiful resolution and healing. And but it can't happen if you only have one piece of it, like only the alpha is the only receptor that's being activated. It's mm -hmm. like all you have is the on switch. 
and you don't have the off switch. And so you end up in this terrible state and it's so misunderstood. And really it is not complex. The mechanisms that happen intracellularly, they're complex, of course, but the basic foundational understanding that estrogen is about the whole process. But if you only have one receptor that's being activated, you have this complete misrepresentation of what estrogen does in the body. And you end up with this completely crazy pro-inflammatory chronic state that you get from being on birth control pills, from mm -hmm. taking Premarin, from taking oral estrogen, because it always, even if you take estradiol orally, it's converted and goes into the bloodstream as estrone. Yeah. Now, estrone is not evil. It's just, it's like, you know, the Chinese got it right. You need balance, you know, you need the yin with the yang, <laughs> you know, yes. you need both. And now we understand this and we didn't understand any of this back in the day when the Women's Health Initiative came out. But now we do. So why are we still thinking like 20 years ago, thinking right. process, like, let's get over it and move on, you know, and stop being stuck. Too many people get stuck in with old, wrong data. You know, like I've had to change my mind a thousand times over about things I was taught in medical school that were blatantly wrong. We have yep. to be able to change our thinking when we actually get new information. We can't be stuck. And estrogen is our best friend, ladies. <laughs> so yes, on it. Well, this has been. I mean, your your information. I'm just blown away. Everybody is is chiming in that I can see on the chat saying this is such amazing information. So we we are coming to the end of our time. However, I think I need to bring you back on because you are crazy popular <laughs> with all of my <laughs> listeners right now. Crazy popular, and you've given us such amazing information. I'm so happy that we timed it with the Amazon release I of know. your book. So please it, tell people a nugget that you can leave them with. And I promise we will put your, all of your information in the show notes for the podcast, but also tell them where they can find your book. And, and I'll let you say what it's called again, so you can repeat it. Well, to age in a healthy way or to be young and to stay healthy, we need to have it all. We can't just do one thing. It's complex. That's why the medical system doesn't want to deal with it. We need to have the right food at the right time. Sometimes we need to eat. Sometimes we need to not eat. We need to sleep, but at the right time. And we yep. need the right kind of sleep, like you know, the right REM sleep and long wave sleep and slow wave sleep and so forth. So we need to have everything right. We need to have sunlight. We need to, but not to get a burn. We need to have fitness, but not to overdo our exercise. Everything has to hit the sweet spot. And it's the same with hormones. We need to have physiologic balanced hormones of every sort. And they work together with this beautiful complex web where like thyroid relates to estrogen, estrogen relates to progesterone and testosterone, and estrogen is very key to the function of oxytocin. I mean, there's a million things that they all interrelate. It's a complex web and we have to do it all. Is that hard? Yeah, but that's what it is to stay optimally healthy. And we need to understand these things. And then we need to take positive steps. That's why you can't just throw hormones at women. You can't just throw food at women. You have to do it all at every stage of life. And it's worth it You to feel wonderful every day when you wake up to face yes. the world and to have your brain working well. I see brain fog like there's no tomorrow. And we don't want to be living in a world of depression and brain fog and anxiety. None of this has to happen. We just have to take all these positive steps to keep our bodies optimized. And to and I always say, don't be afraid of the wrong things. We spend so much time worrying about the wrong things. Not that we should spend our time worrying about things we can't fix, but we really should focus on the right things that um, are troubling our bodies and our uh, you know, our basic survival and not worry about things that are not really the problem. We have mm -hmm. the first step in solving a problem is to define the problem. And that's where, you know, I try, you know, to say, okay, let's really figure out what the problem is and then let's come up with really optimal solutions. So mm -hmm. don't just do one thing, do it all, even if you take baby steps. I love that. That was beautifully said. Beautifully yeah. said. And so, for my book, okay, just yes. throw that in. Yeah. So go to Amazon and it it's, you know, menopause, 50 things you need to know. And it's a really small book because you, and it's organized for the, 
the time when you're pre-menopause, the first yep. decade of menopause, and then all the time thereafter, because so many things that women experience are not understood to be hormonally related. And when you go through it and you see all the different things that can happen and everyone experiences the transformation from reproductive years into menopause and postmenopausal years differently. So some people have more of this or that, you know? So, but understanding it, once again, defining the problem, understanding the root cause of it and how it relates to the changing hormones your body is experiencing and then practical solutions is what the book is all about. I love that. I love that. I cannot wait to get my copy and we will definitely put the link for it as well. But Dr. Gersh, I need to have you back on. So we'll definitely figure out a time for that. But I thank you so much for your time today and coming on to share your information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Okay.